at the end of the sermon from August 4th, which I know you've all committed to memory at this point. <laughs> all right. I'm reminding you because I wasn't here last week. But at the end of the sermon from August 4th on Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, there was this exhortation at the end. Beloved, we are exhorted and begged through the words of Ephesians to grow, to grow up. For the love of God, to the glory of God, and for the well-being of our neighbors, we are to grow up and be become the body of Christ in the world, bearing into the world by acts of love that which has been born in us by faith. Okay? So even if you weren't here on August 4th, you now feel like you have been here. Okay? That exhortation still holds in Ephesians 4, 25 to 5, 2. Now, I know that our reading was Ephesians 5, 15 to 20, but I decided that since I wasn't here last week, and when I was looking at the two different, I wanted to stay in Ephesians, because we've been in Ephesians for the past four weeks. I wanted to stay in Ephesians, and I looked at the two different passages, and I was like, oh, I like last week's better. <laughs> so I'm continuing, and then next week I'll do the Ephesians 6 part. Okay, so I'll skip over this week's. But I just wanted to let you know the reasoning why we're talking about Ephesians 4.25 to 5.2 and not 5.15 to 20. Okay? So the exhortation to grow up and to bear into the world by deeds that which is born in us by faith exists in 4.25 to 5.2. The Ephesians are given not generalized commands, but specific ways to work out their faith through deeds of love to the glory of God and to the well-being of the neighbor. Okay, remember that as soon as we concluded chapter three of Ephesians and we hit chapter four, we started hitting the ethical portion of the letter that the doxology is going to impact our praxis. And Linda asked me at the end of that service and said, what does praxis mean? You use that word all the time. And it just means your actions, your habits, your practice in the world, okay? So the first three chapters of Ephesians, by way of reminding you, it was all doxological, meaning a, proclaiming the glory of God and God's work in the world and in us and bringing us to faith and choosing us and sealing us with the Holy Spirit, et cetera, et cetera. And then that moved into, that doxological stuff moved into this practical stuff, this praxis, this what do we do now in the world? Because of this, we now do this. Right, But the neat thing about the way Ephesians is constructed is that the doxological, the praising of God, renders the hearer active in the world, which then causes what to happen? The neighbor to praise God. So that's what Ephesians is getting at, is this big circular motion that God moves in us through us and then brings God's self, others to God's self. Okay, and so in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, you get a lot of the do this and don't do that kind of stuff, right? But it's, it's stuff that we do in the world that brings glory and honor to God and causes our neighbor to say God is good, right? How good is God? How good is God? <laughs> okay, there we go, right? So good, Right? And that's what we do with our actions in the world. It's not just about meeting here on Sunday. It's about what we do Monday through Saturday out in the world that causes people, other people, to say, God is so good. Taste and see the Lord is good. Right? So that's what we say in our actions, not just in proclaiming gospel truths, right? But actually loving the neighbor as God has loved us. Okay, so that's what's going on in Ephesians. So here in our portion, 425 to 52, these deeds are produced by love, are the deeds that reflect the truth of what God has done for the Ephesians through Christ. And by the power of the Holy Spirit are the very exact way the Ephesians participate in furthering God's mission in the world, bringing the kingdom of humanity into confrontation with the reign of God. Yeah, and you thought being Christian was boring and safe. It's not. Each of us, each of these three ethical chapters guides the Ephesians toward actions that materialize in the world what is occurring, what has occurred, what will occur by faith in their hearts, so joined together with God. There's a lot of mystical elements in the, in the letter of Ephesians. Everyone hears Ephesians and they think what? They go immediately to that one verse, the three verses where it says, wives, unto your own husbands, submit, 
We all, uh, most of our brains go straight to there, but the letter itself is actually robust with theology and statements about God and really highlights this union of the believer with God, that you are not alone, you are so joined with God. Anyway, it's just really, really beautiful. So Ephesians, so let me read to you just a little bit of the Ephesians passage, right? On which account, do not distress the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed toward the day of redemption. Therefore, become an imitator of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as also Christ loved us and betrayed himself on our behalf, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Okay, so considering what Christ has done and the urging of the Ephesians to grow, Paul exhorts the Ephesians to renounce untruth, preferring instead that they speak truth, each one, with their neighbor because we are a part of one another. The Ephesians are to leave behind the life of lies peddled by the kingdom of humanity in exchange for the truth, which is the word that is of the reign of God. Okay, so it's almost as if we use a, um, spectacles imagery. Imagine that living in the kingdom of humanity, you have one set of glasses. And then you become Christian. You encounter God by faith in Christ and are sealed with the Holy Spirit. God says, like a good optometrist, give me those glasses. They no longer work for you. Here's a new pair. So then we walk through that union, that encounter with God with these new glasses. And now we see the world differently. Okay? We do not ascribe to the lie. We can start to say, that's a lie. That's an untruth because I have this truth by which I can compare everything else. Okay, so that's what Ephesians 4 is setting, setting, setting us up with, okay? In other words, if God is made known to them by the power of the Holy Spirit, okay, in other words, if God is love and has loved them, the Ephesians, then they, in desiring to speak the truth, share this love in word and deed toward their neighbor because according to Ephesians, everyone is a part of everyone else. So imagine seeing through the eyes, through the lenses of the kingdom of humanity and seeing everyone out for their own, each for their own. Now, for the Christian, it would, the truth would be, no, actually, we're all part of one another. So your pain hurts me. I'm gonna, I want to help you. Your hunger makes me hungry, and I want to get you food. Okay? We start to see this, like, symbiotic, umbilical connection, right? Where we're all feeding off of, like, the same source. We're all united and connected. Okay, this orientation away from untruth and toward truth grows the community of solidarity into becoming like Christ and displaying their righteous clothing of works of love. Okay, so in seeing the world differently, this community solidifies, gets stronger, and then proceeds out into the world. Okay, the Ephesians are to be the well-clothed representatives of God in the world. Wherever they go, God is there and that ground is holy. Think Exodus 3. Moses, take off your shoes for where you're standing is holy ground because of God's presence. But we are the clay vessels that carry the Holy Spirit, God's truth in us. That means wherever we go is sacred ground. Nothing is unsacred now, okay? That division is collapsed. So a part of being so well clothed is knowing when and where to allow one's anger to do the walking and the talking. If you remember the passage from last week, do not let the sun go down on your anger, right? If it is against injustice and oppression of the neighbor, then it is well placed and will fuel righteous deeds. But according to this verse in Ephesians, if this is what the word should be translated as more technically violent irritation, okay, like being severely annoyed by someone is different than righteous anger at injustice, okay? It is misplaced when you want to use your anger to defend yourself because of your pride, okay? So conjoined here is the demand not to steal. The one who steals no longer steals, says Paul. There is no designation specifically to whom Paul is speaking, so we must keep a broad view in mind when we think of theft, all right? Therefore, everyone must grow weary working well by their own hands, writes Paul. Rather than this being strictly about petty theft, though it is addressing this type of thieving, 
okay? It's also about obtaining money without working with one's hands. That's the emphasis, is how are you getting your funds? Are you working with your hands? Theft, no matter what, and no matter who is doing it, is not to be tolerated by the Ephesians. Why? So that they may have the ability to bestow to the to bestow to those who have needs, okay? For Paul, the emphasis is on providing for the needy. Thus, those who earn by means of skimming off the top of what's not theirs, not done by their own hands, are exhorted to stop and find hard work so to give from what is theirs. And this, in turn, becomes how those who steal out of necessity no longer need to. Do you hear that in the exhortation is the solution? right? If someone's stealing because they need to, and the people who are kind of not really working, but they're kind of getting their funds just from like, from the top of something, right? If you switch, you get these people to work, then these people have what they need because this excess over here can go over here, okay? Moving along, the author brings up the fruit of the lips next as a measure of the heart of the believer. If the Ephesians are to be clothed in righteous garb, then truly their speech must reflect such a status. The Ephesians are to prevent every rotten word from leaving their mouths. Rather, they are to spew forth whatever is good toward the building up so that it might give grace to those who hear. Okay, this language is really, really important. The community is not only to prohibit the stealing of material goods, but also the stealing of the honor and dignity of each person in the community. Words designed to destroy rather than build are to be avoided at all costs because this community who wears Christ and is to be like Christ is to see each and every word in a sacramental light, giving grace to those who hear. That's how the Greek reads, okay? It, if, according to Ephesians, your language has a c capability of being sacramental in character because it, part it participates in giving God's grace. The Eucharist does it, and the baptism does it. But so do your words. Words must be drenched in truth and love. Then finally, the community is exhorted not to distress the Holy Spirit of God in whom they have been sealed toward the day of redemption by letting all bitterness and passionate outbursts and wrath and clamoring against each other and slandering be removed from them and together with all malice, okay? So all of that bad juju, all that bad vibes, okay, is supposed to be eliminated from the community of Ephesians, okay? In other words, anything that tries to grab the edges of this finely stitched quilt and pull it apart and destroy it is the very cause of God's distress. To grieve the Holy Spirit is to, ca is to cause God's spirit distress, and it is to tear apart that which God has joined together. God's self and God's people, thus God's people with each other. Okay? This community is to turn toward each other, reinforcing the well-stitched seams, being useful and tender-hearted toward each other, giving freely to each other, just as God in Christ gave freely to you. The exhortation lands in the laps of the Ephesians. You who have received so much from God in Christ are to build up, not tear down. You are to be compassionate, not dispassionate. You are to be useful toward each other and not useless. You are, to be, you are to give freely and not hoard and steal. Do you see how in those do this, don't do that, you have the don't, the, the don't do that's are all things that pull apart and separate, isolate. But all the do's is all about coming together and being closer and community, and love, right? It, it builds, and it builds, and it builds, okay? So in this way, these humble, breakable vessels, which we learned about in the beginning of Ephesians, become the imitators of God as beloved children. And by being this way toward each other and toward their neighbors, they walk in love just as Christ loved and walked in love toward us and betrayed himself on our behalf, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In other words, the Ephesians do not need to perform special material sacrifices to please God, but they themselves now become the fragrant sacrifice. Those who betray themselves, put themselves aside on behalf of others, not just their family and friends, but their neighbor, whom, whoever they are. 
These are the imitators of God and are like Christ. These are the divine representatives in the world who are inspired and sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's not those who are going out and causing division and derision within the community. It's those who participate in the bringing together that are imitators of God. Keep that in your head, okay? The, those who imitate God bring together, pull together, support, compassion, feel. It is not about you're bad and condemnation and judgment and self-righteousness. And it's all about being for the other person, okay? So in conclusion, working like a talented seamstress, the author of the letter to the Ephesians stitches the hearer to the fullness of God. Through each intentional retelling of what God has done for us in Christ and how the Spirit applies this to our lives is a careful working over the seam, joining the two together, adding layer upon layer of words as thread to forbid the joining to break. Think about it. Every chapter runs you through what God has done in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is a constant reminder that you are joined to God. Thus, with the same deafness, this author seamstress stitches each of the hearers together, anchoring them together into God and together with each other. These many are one, and this one is joined to God, thus they are all one, dividing walls destroyed and laws of separation rendered inoperative. The believers are chosen from the beginning of time to be those whom God will work through to further God's divine revolution of love, life, and liberation that God started, revealed in Christ, and makes available to all who hear God's summons by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what Ephesians is about. It's not about wives submitting to husbands. It's bigger. That's just a petty thing to get worked up about and worthy and if it actually was assigned, I would dive into that passage wholeheartedly, but the lectionary actually skips over it. <laughs> Wise choice, I'm guessing, <laughs> right? All that has transpired thus far in Ephesians brings us to the real and practical conclusions that we are not our own and that we are God's and thus our neighbors. Our actions, no matter how private we think they are, impact someone somewhere. We live not for ourselves, but for Christ and for the divine mission revealed by God through Christ. In this part of Ephesians, we see that every part of our existence is tied up, is knotted up, is threaded up into this divine tapestry of God's activity in the world. Our worlds and our words and thoughts carry weight. Our actions have force and power. Our bodies are to bear Christ into the world, reminding the world that God is not dead that there's always another way, and that hope and peace are possible. This is not about being seduced into the slumber of saccharine positivity, but about looking the kingdom of humanity square in the eye with those new eyes, with those new reign of God spectacles, and speak the truth saying, no, this is not all there is. This is not the only way. There's more. Things can be different. Anything is possible with God. So beloved, all of that to say, let us go love because we have been so loved.